for two. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Um, uh, I'm not going to assign specific times right now. We'll just try and get through our agenda as quickly as possible since we've been here for a couple hours already. Um, do we have any public comment at this time? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris Travis. Uh, will the public have an opportunity to comment after um, the item in regards to the COVID-19 updates um, in regards to the start of the school year? Or should we do that now? You can you can go ahead and do that now, I think. Because I see there's two public comments in there, so that's why I was. Yeah, no, I oh, mean, yeah, you, there is a second one, so. Yeah, you, you can do it either way. Um, we will have a second public comment, I think. Oops. Let's see. It's turn off mine, but I think it's 11. 11. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 11. 11. I was getting confused too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there is a public comment at the end of the meeting. So it's up to you whether you want to comment now or later. Um, I'll go now. Uh, how much time can I be allotted for a comment? Um, three minutes. Three minutes. Start and then see where. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I had um, I received the information about the COVID protocols for our children when they return to school here in a couple of weeks in regards to uh, mask wearing being mandated. Um, as you know, and most of the country knows, it's a very hotly debated uh, topic at this point. Uh, so I just wanted to circle back. So, so February, March, 2020, um, you know, COVID sprung, we didn't know what it was, we didn't know how to protect ourselves. We, uh, uh, we um, got guidance from experts. Uh, we went through the 2020 school season of masks, being told to mask, isolate, and basically wait for a vaccine. Um, and, we, uh, and we all know that um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, there's been lots of data out there, case studies. We have the vaccine that's been out since since uh, April, um, et cetera. Um, and what we do know right now is that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease that infects both human and animals. Um, it's, it's very commonly like the flu. Um, and like the flu, what we're gonna see and we're starting to see now is that uh, these vaccines will probably be mostly ineffective, just like the flu. The average flu vaccina vaccination is 15 to 40% effective a year. Um, what we do also know is that COVID-19 carries very little risk of dying or respiratory intensive care in children under 18 years of age. It's very publicized, uh, very easy to get the data. What we also know is that the virus is 0.12 microns in size. That is the size of the virus. We also know that an N95 mask filters out 0.3 microns or larger particles at a rate of 95% effective. And we do know that cloth masks, like most of you are wearing there, filter out the same size, 0.3 microns or larger at a 70% rate. So, I mean, quickly there, a little common sense tells you that uh, right now we're trying to filter a particle in the air with a mass that is not intended for that use. Uh, what we do know is Vermont exceeded the goal of vaccinations already. It leads the country. What we also know and should know as educators that by washing your hands is by far the number one way to combat not only COVID-19, but all diseases that we inquire, uh, that we uh, have on a daily basis. What we do know that 4.3 million cases of COVID in children under 18 in the United States resulting in less than 2% of all the hospitalizations and resulting in less than a quarter of a percent of all the deaths in the nation. We, and and why, why do I go through all these is because, you know, for years we've had the flu in schools, the flu on average, and you can look all this data up, 
kills between 50 and 200 children in the United States every year. But yet we've never done anything about it. Maybe at the worst, if there's a big outbreak, we go home for a day. Um, what we are seeing in our children, and I would expect as educators, is the side effects of mask wearing. And they're starting to outweigh any type of benefits of wearing the mask. We're seeing bilateral headaches in our students. We're seeing rashes and irritations by the mask. We're seeing bacterial infections due to ex excess moisture in the mask for long periods of time and not being cleaned well. We're seeing a false sense of security by wearing a mask that we think that we're safe. We're seeing that our children are uh, have lost inattention in schools. We're seeing that uh, and finding out by reading in articles that a majority of our learning is actually done by looking at someone's face and reading their facial expressions, not necessarily by hearing the words that come out of their mouth. We can't do that when we're wearing a mask. We, we also know that mask blocks emotional signals that we receive from people. And, and we also un, unfortunately are seeing that there has been an increased suicide rate in the United States as a direct correspondent of wearing a mask and our children being isolated from doing their normal activities. Um, I, I don't, I really don't understand uh, the, the methodology behind the mask uh, mandate with our school and what the school hopes to get out of by our children wearing masks because clearly as the, the data that I have given you all, which is very easy to look up, you could probably take about 20 minutes on Google and find it all. The science behind the mask wearing it shows that you're not going to get what you think that you're going to get out of a child wearing a mask. Um, I, I would drastically, and I know there's many, many parents that have in the community that feel the same way. Um, unfortunately, with the with the Google Meet system and not being able to see it in person, you probably won't see a lot of people join on uh, to talk about it. But it's a very concern. Um, but a lot of us don't want to see our children in masks this year. Um, there's been plenty of time to get vaccinations if you want to as a an adult. Um, and then we're just seeing that, you know, that children are not greatly affected by this disease as, as other ones. And I, I think the question I have for the board at this time is, you know, other than, other than saying that the Vermont Department of Health or the Bar Vermont Department of Education has, has mandated or, or I'm sorry, not mandated, has suggested mask wearing. Is it what what do you believe that we're gonna accomplish by our children wearing these masks? Um, all right, thank you for your comment. I mean, I think we can we will be discussing the COVID-19 updates and mitigation techniques and later in the um thing. So I think we can get into that sort of part when we get to that part of the agenda. Um, right now we have Michelle, is her hand raised now? So would you like to speak, Michelle? Hi, I'm going to put a face to my name just so people can see me. Um, uh, thanks for letting me talk today. So I am Dr. Michelle Sama. Um, to my kids, I'm just mom. But I um, have 12 years of post-secondary education uh, in science. I have a doctorate from a college of medicine. And I teach microbiology and chemistry, epidemiology, and kind of um, I've been doing this for the past nine years. So I've got a lot of experience in this. And I've been really closely following the data and um, trying to hopefully uh, help people to understand why some of these mitigation strategies are so valuable. Um, and I understand, Chris, where you're coming from, and I totally agree that masks are not convenient, and they they can, in fact, cause some problems. But I also um, would like to report that COVID is not the same as the flu. That's the first thing. Second, the vaccines are working quite well. Um, the data is uh, very clear on that. So. Um, obviously, the more people we can get vaccinated, the safer our kids are going to be. Really, that's the best strategy. But unfortunately, kids that are 12 and under, they don't have a vaccine yet. So we've got to do the best that we can, given the circumstances that we have. Um, you're right that viral particles are too small. 
they're too small to get stuck inside of um, a pore size that a mask might have. But the interesting thing is, is that viral particles aren't like little helicopters. They can't travel on their own. They reside within the aerosol droplets that are coming out of our lungs. And there's a couple factors that the masks really have that keep that aerosol in. First, a water droplet, it's a polar molecule. It's got electrostatic forces. It's gonna get stuck. It's too big to travel through the mask. So that means that you are indeed trapping not just the respiration, the stuff that comes out of your lungs, but with it, you're keeping those viral particles on the inside. So that alone is the best way that we can prevent our kids from coming in contact with this virus. Secondly, there's been an unfortunate amount of data that's come out more recently. There are lots of schools that have gone back, um, obviously in, in less vaccinated, higher transmission areas. And what we are seeing is that right now up to 12% of cases are happening in children. Um, and there are the highest amount of children right now hospitalized due to the coronavirus than we've ever had, even during the other peaks that we've had. Um, it still hasn't been determined yet if Delta is more severe, but they are pointing to it being having more severe uh, side effects and a higher level of secondary um, MIS-C, which is a uh, post-inflammatory condition that is common in children, especially in the age groups between 6 and 11, which is most of our elementary kids. Um, so um, I don't use Google as a source for finding information, um, but I have lots and lots of um, scientific reviews and literature that can show that masks work and that um, this is a, an appropriate mitigation strategy for keeping our kids in school where they really need to be, because I would argue that having them in school masked is still going to be better than being at home and virtual, because I feel like that's a lot more damaging for kids. So thank you for letting me talk. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Um Tammy, would you like to say something? Um, Michelle's approach was significantly more scientific than I can. Um, as a vaccinated individual, I recognize the fact that I can carry COVID and transmit it to a vulnerable, unvaccinated population. And the information out there regarding the masks, um, it, it, it makes an impact. Um, and so I appreciated reading the update today. Thank you. All right, thanks. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to comment at this time? Okay, um, so we're going to move on with our agenda then. Um, first would be to approve the minutes of Tuesday, June 15th. Um, do we have a motion? I'll move it. Second. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We approve the minutes of Tuesday, June fifteenth. Uh, do we have any board comment at this time? Um, can I just go for it? Um, this is my first in-person meeting in a really long time. I don't know exactly how many months it's been, but I just want to say that this facility is beautiful. The floors are shining. <laughs> Um, I just think our facility staff has done an amazing job, and I'm so excited for kids to come back to school. And thank you. I just want to appreciate those people. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the superintendent report. Uh, it's great to have you all in person to see you. Uh, a few of you I haven't met yet in person, maybe mm -hmm. since my hire. Thank like Chris. Um, <laughs> but um, it's been interesting building relationships this way with board members. So my report talks a lot about the work that's been going on. Your your teachers and staff have been working incredibly hard in red this summer. I know the principals will highlight some more of that in their report, but it's pretty significant. Um, so it's a huge celebration. I would say that one of the things we're working on in the SU is to create this culture of continuous improvement. And the way you do that, I believe, is you have to do your planning work in the summer. 
so that you can actually act on it come fall. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to plan and act at the same time, there's not enough bandwidth. So I would say there's been a ton of planning done that now we can act on it um, from day one, which is exciting. Uh, we had all of our new teachers engaged in a literacy PD offering for elementary teachers. Um, that was put on by Amy Top, and then we have over 20 staff and uh, several of our new staff participating in math as a second language from uh, VMI uh, next week, which is exciting uh, to work on their content area expertise in math. And then, you know, I would say it was a reprieve to not think about COVID for six weeks. I mean, I got to say it filled my bucket um, It let me do the work that I was excited to do when you hired me. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in the midst of COVID now and I'll give some updates on 8.2, but I would say that that's taking more of my time uh, over the last week um, than it was prior. But on to Adams and Annette Rhodes have been terrific hires. I'll just let you know. Uh, their work ethic is incredible. I see the principal shaking their heads. They're really strong communicators. And um, even when my attention is getting turned on things like policy right now and um, COVID and sometimes personnel stuff, it hasn't allowed us to lose momentum on instruction and assessment. So that's exciting. Um, and I'll end it just to give you an example of the interdependence we're trying to create. Uh, all the admin assistants across the SU came today for our training at the SU offices um, that was really focused on procedure and process, but to also ensure that we're putting some procedures and processes across the SU um, around registration and things of that nature. And I do believe we're ready to launch uh, an online digital registration process too. Soon, very soon. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah. Next Sunday. Sunday. maybe next Monday. So there's a lot of things happening. Um, you know, the SU is going to unveil, I think, after the first of the year, a digital platform for substitutes. So we better use utilize our substitutes across the SU. Right now, they just are going on paper list um, and not necessarily, you know, the way subs work is often you get your subs that you always call. Well, there's times that we're not calling those subs that other schools could use them. Mm. And so that's going to be done through an online system um, that subs can then sign right up for teachers across the SU. So there's some exciting things happening around inter, um, you know, dependence. And I'll take any questions, folks. Have. On behalf of parents with multiple students in multiple years, year after year, filling out those forms in triplicate, duplicate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Ray. Ray, Ray that's, Ray. yes, thank you, Ray. Yeah, Ray. Thank me Tuesday, but yeah. If it, if it works, it would be beautiful. Yep, that's the goal, to make it easier for parents. I mean, to give you a sense of, as an SU, when I first came on board, I said to Ray, I wanted to put out a Blackboard Connect call. The SU had no ability to communicate with all of its stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That's where we were a year ago um, on July 1. So we've come a long ways in our ability to outreach and things and to better streamline things. Mm -hmm. so, so we're gaining. I know there's still a lot of work to do, but Ray's been working incredibly hard. So. Yeah. Our district misses you, but appreciates it, the work you do at the SUV. Say his family message. I'm <laughs> sure they <laughs> don't. I can't have him back either. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, no, that's cool. Everybody says, we're going to talk about our SBAC data. And I also wanted to say, though, to follow up on Jamie's point that I just quickly counted on the document on my phone, so it's not exact, but we had over 150. Uh, staff faculty days this summer of PD. So that 150 individual days combined, of course, groups of eight or six or three. You can think about that as like the work that was accomplished. And every one of those folks, as you might imagine, and you know many of them, probably gave us more than that. And the work they produced is awesome. So it's nice to have great leadership or very strong leadership from the central office. I want to call it great. <laughs> so we can always continuously improve, right? Right? Mm -hmm. If you think you're great, no. Nice. Good. So 
a heck of a recovery. I'm going to drop that Ming boss. <laughs> the, the link to our SBAC data is at the bottom of our principal's report. And, and maybe we can kind of go through the goals. If you have questions, we linked a lot of documents. Mm -hmm. We generate a lot of documents to, huh. to service new systems, uh, new ways of doing things for the coming year. Uh, probably more information that you want to take a look at, but it's there if you want to, to pour it over. The, the first document is uh, the MTSS non-negotiables, which is a list of all the MTSS team structures that we'll be meeting throughout the course of the coming year to work on data, to work on alignment of curriculum across grade levels in math and in English, um, intensive and targeted intervention teams, how those teams are going to meet, who's going to be on those teams, how often they're going to meet, very specific guidelines and expectations that we're going to uphold uh, to make sure the kids are getting the support they need as part of our multi-tiered system of support. And so when somebody says, what is MTSS, this is like the detail of what MTSS is for us. Around the structure. There's yeah. still things in there, though, that you're <clears throat> going to say, like, help me with this. And we're ready to help you and the community understand that. Yeah. Earlier, Andrew asked for an org chart uh, to kind of talk about some of these structures and when we can work on that down the road. But uh, just in case you missed it, uh, Jamie referenced all the, the hiring for personnel work he's been doing this summer. Uh, we are working on getting classroom-based case managers that would be one for each of the three alternative classrooms. Uh, and we think some of those folks are, are uh, almost under contract. Uh, I think there are one or two that still need to be found and recruited. Uh, but that would be each of the three classrooms, elementary, middle, and high school, having someone who has a bachelor's level of counseling, therapeutic intervention background to be there to work with the small groups of kids that work in those alternative classrooms. At a higher level, we each now have a Clara Martin school-based clinician that's a master's level therapist. Uh, so somebody could be with an MSW, could be a, you know, somebody working towards a psychologist degree, uh, what have you. Um, but we'll have that support. So where we had one day in each building last year of a school-based clinician, we will now have a full week of a school-based clinician in each building. So it's a phenomenal increase in our capacity to provide therapy to students, um, which is super exciting. Um, on top of that, something that we'd almost given up uh, hope that would come together because we know how scarce these folks are around the state. Um, we are employing two SAP counselors for a second growth, so another community partner. So there'll be contractors who come into our buildings to work with students. The, the uh, SAP counselor for the high school has now been in twice. Uh, we started to talk about what types of services she can provide to students. And she comes from a a uh, inpatient substance abuse background so she's really going to be help helpful working with our kids who have substance issues uh and a whole slew of other things she has a master's in social work so I, I i i couldn't be more excited about the capacity that that's going to be part of the support we can provide to high school students uh and we'll have one on the bethel campus as well to, to be home one at the middle school, one at the high school. Then the beauty of, of some of these community partnerships is we're, we're cost sharing. So we're not paying the full salary of these positions. Uh, a lot of the costs are going to be picked up through Medicaid uh, and being able to out bill out for uh, services to the insurance company. And then as for pick up. So will we be able to retain them beyond? That's the goal. Okay. So we'll start budgeting for them, et cetera. Well, what I've said to the principals is, and what I was saying earlier is, I think we got to figure out how do we reinvest some of the money we've been budgeting to okay. cover some of these positions. Right. And you know, we do have more CFG money, and we we're we're building up our Medicaid reserves again at PSU as well. Mm -hmm. That went toward Countess, like right? Right. And so we the SU in general receives. About 1.5 million a year in federal grants in Title One, Two, Three, and Four, um, and that's prior to Medicaid. So there's a there's a base there to be pretty sustainable with the work that we're doing. 
And it's the management of the money that is really helping us out. Mm. What was the CFG grant? Is that? Consolidated federal grant. That's your titles, one, two, three, four. We received quite a bit. Like compared to where I just was at prior and came from at CVSU, which is similar size, we still receive about a half a million more than they do a year. Well, we have, I mean, because we have need. need. Yeah, right. It's right. based on need. Yeah, right. It, it seems like you're interested in these details. So yeah. should we keep going mm -hmm. at this level of granularity for you? That makes sense, or do you want us to? I know, I just jumped in, so there's a, the rest of the group. <laughs> 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 it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of Let's give a little. excitement yeah. here. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, last year we brought on a coordinator of student support. Um, we've had difficulty filling a position of intensive program coordinator to oversee the three alternative classrooms. We have a super qualified and experienced coordinator of student support. So we've added to her list of responsibilities, helping us to manage the alternative programs. Uh, what she was doing a little bit of last year, she already knows the majority of the students who are in these alternative classrooms. Um, it's a, just a position we didn't think we could fill or go without to start the year. And so we're in the process of putting Ashley Grote in charge of the three lead teachers in those classrooms, the classroom-based case managers, the teachers that push in to support the academic learning of the students in those classrooms. Um, it's and a big undertaking. It's a we'll big initiative. Special ed funding to cover that. Mm -hmm. and she has a special the, ed endorsement, okay. and she just finished a master's in psychology this year during the pandemic. <laughs> so those three classrooms are all special ed funded, right. which are SU expenses. They're housed here, and what we've talked about is the idea of being that those students really need a sense of belonging and not seen as a separate offshoot program, but that they're part of the school. And so we're trying to see it as programming so that those students are accessing courses within the school setting. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, like at the middle and high school, if there's high school students that are best served by that from you know other outside districts, instead of us placing them in a different alternative setting that they would be placed here and be one of your students so tuition dollars would follow plus we keep um su wide wrvsu special ed money here and not funding a different program that's out of district and the so, older model had been isolated and boxed out mm -hmm. our model is to have a very fluid and these students take classes with other students where it's appropriate and some of the students in the larger group join in there for certain projects or for therapy. Or, so it starts looking like, oh, that's the school. Right. It's just another classroom in our school. That's our goal. Um, I think I'd be interested in kind of a report looking at how we're doing in that sometime sure. in the middle of the year, like what percentage of the students are taking classes in the regular school and you know, like how it's working out. Well, and just kind of a, you know, it's not all about the finances, but uh, next week I'll be meeting with the second student who were, who's enrolled in one of our outplacement programs at a tune of $75,000 a year. So if we get the second student back, that's $150,000 that will be in the local, that left our local budget that will now be, you know, this isn't, a, a, you know, the average student cost program. Uh, but there will be substantial financial savings for us by by keeping it in house. It also we talked sends about the, over the years. It sends but. the message that you belong here, right? And it's we how, care about you. Mentally yeah. healthy yeah. for them, for our community, Absolutely. to keep them here. Yes. Yeah. Pretty excited to be able to yeah, we're bring some excited. kids back to graduate with us. And there's also going to be some adventure-based uh, education in those upper classrooms, at least. Lots of good stuff. So that's MTSS. There's a little bit more in the report, but we'll save that for another time for you. Or you can read about that it. That was a lot. <laughs> um, we have under enhancement of our proficiency based learning model, attention to literacy, math, and flexible pathways. Uh, we've put together a schedule for faculty meetings and professional development, especially with the half day in services for the next year. So there's a link in here to the monthly, well, the whole schedule for the year of how many meetings we're going to have of our data teams. Or, well, not all of the meetings, but 
more than half of the meetings are scheduled already. Some of them will be meeting after school, and we got to figure out when members of the teams will be able to meet after school. And we also want to include faculty in designing those, mm -hmm. our faculty leadership group. We're meeting with them after school. You want to talk, Andrew? No, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Two white guys talking. Hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. You're doing a great job. We just tried to give snippets on what some of the people did over the summer. Uh, whether you care or don't care, there's the assessment calendar for the school year. So, we usually report out after this assessment um, windows to you as the board. We included our in service plan so you can see what the teachers will be doing when they come back to school. Our welcome letter to staff. My welcome letter that is mailed today on this campus and I think yesterday in Bethel, so that should be going out to elementary families. Invitation to the ice cream socials that we're having in the elementary schools. So yeah, yes, if you invited. want, what's that? They're invited. Yeah, well, more than invited. I do love when people come and scoop for me, so come <laughs> and scoop with me. <laughs> Um, and then I think then we can just move on to reporting out on our results. So um, yeah, yeah, I, guess, yeah. I guess a couple people have the questions. So the letters, the welcome letters going out, but families are wondering about, you know, who's going to be their kid's teacher. Those and are the welcome letters. Yep. Those are in the welcome letters. So there's letter a letter from me and then they get a letter from their, their classroom teacher. Okay. Yep. And so there'll be info in there about like what they if there's any materials that they need for class and yeah. stuff. Yeah, like and really should have by the end of the week. If you yeah. don't, no one really needs anything. Yeah. We can provide mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're trying. To I think there was a that. yeah, there was a question on Facebook about high school students and what they needed for binders and things like that. So I think yeah. Reed sent that yeah. out. You're the binder yeah. person. Yeah. On, I mean, on yeah. Friday we sent out the high school letter, right? And it included the supplies list for each of the teachers okay. in the high school. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, and parents have been super effusively appreciative the last couple of days about yeah. getting all that information. They and I would say what's not in here is that by the end of this week, we will be sending out a survey about bus transportation needs with a copy of the bus routes and also a survey about early morning drop off program and needs around that so we can get that all together before you. I don't know if this one, it's in the principal's report, but it might be, I don't know if it's more of a superintendent question, but the one planet, uh, I guess this question comes up every year, uh, because one planet looks like it's supposed to start, like, what is it, 13? Uh, and so it's like 11 days after school starts. What's the reason for the delay between the first day of school and the first time that one plan is offered because I know that point. I met with Carrie about that. It came up in the executive board last week. It's really staffing right now. Okay. And that's what I was saying before is just them getting up to staff enough that we can open up and offer a quality program. Because it's it's not child care, right? Like the grants about enrichment. Yeah. So getting up to staffing levels where we can actually offer enrichment um, and have teachers teaching, that's just when Carrie's able to get them to, you know be willing. Most of that staff, there's some outside providers, but we also rely on our own teachers. And uh, I think some people feel like, just let me catch my breath for a couple of weeks. And I don't know when to jump on board with that. I don't want to do it day one. And then I, I get just one more comment to add on to that, though, is that, again, those are weeks that happen every year. And it feels like as a school system, we should be better planning for that because it is a hardship for families. And anything that we're doing that's a hardship for families is not going to bring people to our doorstep. I think so, we all agree. I think that in the future we could do that. I just think we also this have year to is not just this sensitive. year is about to start. Uh, yeah. But um I think we can better plan for that next year. Yeah, I, I'll again I ask Carrie to give you guys an update on in the full board in September about all her reasoning around that and then uh and then two with the the half days there's some days where one planet is available but then there's other half days where one plan is not available staffing again because the half days are geared towards support staff having professional development um hyper focused on that and so i'm not saying we may not provide one planet all the time but part of the issue right now is ensuring that we have enough staffing to do it and I think it's also important to know that one planet runs off of the same regs as your pre-K because they take subsidy. 
So what I mean by that is that there's staffing requirement levels. Mm -hmm. So it's not like if we just run we have recess. With ratios, and I think part right. of it is they also have they have a requirement for amount of training that they have to have every yes. year. And I know that some of these days that there's no program is because they're running mandated trainings for the people who are working at one camp. So again, with the you know there are some summer weeks where it's not available. The first two weeks of the year, some of these half days. I feel like it's predictable every year, and. Um, perhaps the pre-K task force could add this to their to the one planet issue to their stuff too. But if it's predictable every year, can we fix it? I think that can that's we a, can we offer something that's not one planet for well, those that may be your answer as eight a board. weeks of the year that it happens? Can we offer something that's not one planet and plan for that? Well, I think there's two pieces there, right? One planet's SU wide. Mm -hmm. Was not just run, so mm -hmm. that's that's a good conversation for the SU board. If it's one planet, if but one planet can't meet the need, then I think you should look at: Do you want to do something as run? Right, and I I think that's also I think it's a, also a philosophical discussion. And, like, yeah. do you want to be a year-round school? Yes, we do. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. But We're almost uh, there. <laughs> I think there's also we need to realize and you know this the, the pool is of people is lower for a lot of good reasons yes yeah and we got to be careful i mean what i keep trying to say is i got to be careful i don't pry everybody exactly mm -hmm. and last year and i hear what you're saying this is not just this year but last year people carried a lot of water for us as you know our mm -hmm. teachers yeah did amazing. amazing we also have some parents in the community that are just as pride absolutely because they've got their kids at home they're trying to hold down a job someone else lost a job so i feel like yes we all have been through a trauma mm -hmm. but moving forward maybe there are some things we can do better yeah and think if about you got them. ideas about recruitment i'm all ears I, this <laughs> is a, if i can find this, them this I is a statewide issue right now we're actually in better shape than some SUs. I mean, we're opening school with all of our classrooms filled. We could be in other places where boards are talking about that's not the case. We're also a continuous improvement organization, right? right? And with right. Jamie running things now, we are that. So this is important information. Yeah, I think if there's ways we can find some ways to make some solutions for, for some additional coverage, that would be good. Uh, yeah, I know people are crying, but you know, I know a couple of families in the community that the mom and the dad have both flown through all of their vacation yeah, and sure. time and you know, they're mm -hmm. you know, one day away from, you know, yeah. potentially, you know, getting in major trouble at work for, you know, having to take care of the kids. But yeah, you, you gotta take right. care of your kids, but you don't want to lose your job either. And so mm -hmm. uh, and maybe for those two weeks having... it's a parent co op kind of thing where we yeah. bring in like two three whatever the parent whatever the adult to child ratio has to be to cover it but that way you don't have to take every single day as vacation you take two of them and you know that someone's watching their kids the other days there's there's got to be a solution somewhere mm -hmm. other questions um the one other thing i had not on that topic but um i saw there was direct instruction training so it was like, are we still sticking with Faunus and Pinnell for kind of a mainstream classroom? The direct instruction is kind of an intervention thing? Or it's an intervention, intervention program. program. All right. Yeah. In right. addition to your focus. In yeah. addition to lots of other interventions yeah. that we yeah. use. It's just <laughs> another, like, with a, the tool in the toolbox that you can use for things. It's yeah. one of the pieces to our menu of intervention. Yeah. Good question. All right. Anything else for the principals before we go on to the data report? Data report? Okay. Do you want to do that now or go through the rest of the reports? Um, oh yeah, I guess we have it up later in the discussion. So why don't we just go through the other report? And then we'll you guys take a break. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, business manager. You have Tara's report. Um, I'm really happy that she's taken a week off. It's well deserved. She's worked really hard. Um, her and uh, Chris Lacarno, just so you know, continue to meet through the MOU that we have with CBSU. Mm -hmm. um, I met with Brian and Chris just last week together, and then they have another meeting on Tuesday. 
um, to wrap up year end around old grants and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. I want you to know that there still is that level of support there with the business office. The, as you can see, there's a lot due in August. So it's been busy. Um, and Tara's worked really hard to meet those deadlines. Um, and if you have any other questions, I'm happy to entertain them if I can be helpful. September, you'll know exactly where your year end was. Um, and uh, then we can use that to, to gauge how we want to go about our budgeting process as we move forward. The SU uh, executive board will get um, the budget calendar again in August, just so you know, at that meeting about how we're proposing we go about it. It worked fairly well for us, so I don't want to tweak too much, but if there's feedback, we can tweak some things on that, but we seem to work quite well. I assume like this year is just particularly complicated because of the SRA stuff and reconciliation, but normally we would get year-end reports kind of a little bit earlier, I'd imagine. Year-end reports are done. I just want to adjust some of the year-end reports to ESSER. Uh, and so that's, I don't want to give you a report and then come back and say, actually, you got another extra hundred to ten thousand dollar revenue. Right. That's really what it was about. All right. Um, policy commands. I'll just real quick say okay. thanks again to Tara for all of her hard work, and it's good to hear she's taking up some time off. Yes. Uh, I think she deserves it. For sure. As you all know. Policy committee. So the policy continu committee continues to work on our equity um, or anti-racism policy, which tomorrow night we'll have a special meeting on. Um, it's in its fourth or fifth draft at the fourth draft at this point in time. Um, we've been taking community feedback on it, and um, to date, the the feedback has been more positive than negative, although. There are a few voices who have shared significant concerns um, and continue to stick with us, which I think is great that they've followed the process and been regularly in attendance at our meetings. So I think it's important to hear from people and, and for them to be present when we're having conversations. Um, I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow night's meeting because I one of the criticisms was that we haven't been as transparent and public about this policy and the drafting of it as possible. And I think that that goes back to what we were saying earlier about when people have concerns about things, they show up. Um, and so I don't think it's for lack of trying or access um, because it's been a meeting happening via Google Meet. And so I feel like anybody with one of these, which is almost everybody, um, can access that meeting. So um, I'm hopeful that people will show up and we'll have a really good discussion. There's and been a lot of time and energy put into drafting landline. this policy. Right. And there's a phone number you can call if you have a landline. So, um, or, or, People can physically come in too, right? Tomorrow. Yep, mm -hmm. we'll be right back in this right space. Yeah. yeah, so. Um, Hybrid tomorrow, right? Yes. So. Right. Will we have the owl again? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I love it when it starts up. Um, I think that's the most significant thing we have to report. Other than just reminding folks, it's the goal to try to take action on this at the full board one way or another in September. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it would roll out after that to local district boards. Yep. So in theory, could this be the last public feedback unless there's another one needed? Well, anytime it's warm, there's opportunity for okay. public mm -hmm. Right. For the full board? Yep. Good. I won't be able to make it tomorrow, but I just want to say publicly thank you to everyone who's worked on this. I know there are a lot of people around this table who have worked on it. And as a parent and a board member, I really appreciate Having read the fourth draft, there's been a ton of very thoughtful edits um, through four drafts, and it hasn't been easy, and it's been long work. So thank you so much. Good discussion and important. It feels really important. Mm -hmm. 
And that's not to say that other kinds of equity and policies around them aren't important. No. No, I think that the, the, you know, the policy committee talked about an equity umbrella. So right. I think that this won't be the first of this type of policy that the board's going to need to weigh in on. Right, won't be the last. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, unless there's anything else for the policy committee, we'll move on to the negotiations committee. Which I guess is Lisa McCurry. So. Well, but, Shannon's been with me too. But okay. I missed the last meeting. So. so. <laughs> what I what I can say is is that um, we were successfully able to reach tentative agreement, which was really exciting. Um, and I can't go into the details of it now, but we certainly will. We're waiting on the um, support staff to look to ratify, hopefully during in service, and so we'll look to pull together a special meeting um, in a wagon wheel in September, just focused on this, hopefully for ratification, and. Um, we did this without going to mediation, which was great. Um, and so I think both sides left the table feeling really good about the work that was done. It was, uh, it was a real positive um, negotiations. So. I love hearing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything to add, Shane? Oh, it had its moments. But yeah, overall, yeah. it was a very yeah, positive it experience. It always does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good. One thing I realized we probably should have had as a discussion item figuring out a replacement for plan for Lisa as she was designing. So I'm sorry, what? Well, we can do that for other maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, that's back data report. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Right, here we go. It's the baby's right here. I don't know where. <laughs> you want me to share it? No, I've got it. Right. I just, uh... So there's a ton of numbers, but I think we can just go right down to the bottom. Up to you. Sit there and look at numbers. Um, so there's generals, and then we broke it down a little bit more. And then we made some observations. So the observations that we gleaned from these so that at BES and SRES, the fourth grade seems to be underperforming compared to the SU and ELA and math, so English, English arts and math. Fifth grade math is also a particular concern. In the elementary, more often than not, female population outperformed the male. While our fifth graders outperformed our overall SU on the science assessment, our eighth and eleventh graders are yeah, underperforming. I suppose you often read these, maybe I don't want to read them. But um, so what I'll say is that moving on to what we observed, I think um, it really makes me feel good about the work we did this summer on math and what we're moving forward to doing for um, intervention for literacy. And I'm excited to see what having a consistent math approach across the both elementaries will do for our support. Uh, in addition to that. And if we want to go chronologically, yeah. you can see that the, again, the math is, is the issue for the middle school, the bigger issue. We were talking about it today. We've talked about it almost at every one of our Tuesday meetings over the summer. And, you know, there's a lot of talk you can do, but there's a bunch of action happening, like Aaron was saying. And part of it is um, and that there's a lot of reading in yeah. the SBAC test. So we have we have the prediction that the better our kids can read and the more they can do close reading mm -hmm. and discernment, the better they'll do on the test. But it's also, we were talking about today, how there's a stamina piece that we don't always expect our students to sit for 45 minutes to an hour to do one thing. So uh, we have, we are know the issues and we're addressing the issues. I think Andrew's point about like aligning math is really important. I sat in on some of the elementary math training this summer, and there's a lot of reading in it, which was awesome because I saw that connection also. And the teachers were breaking down those sentences mm -hmm. and talking about how a kid would see it and what they might confuse. The teachers are building their literacy skills, which they're going to help kids with, mm -hmm. which we believe will transfer to the math skill and testing in a sense. 
We have intervention plans in math as well, which we really haven't put in place hard like we have now. But we feel like our intervention is pretty lined up right now too. I would say too, uh, you heard me say, one of the first things we're gonna do through our PD, through Upper Valley Educator, uh, data-wise out of Harvard is to dig into this data to look at our curriculum. Uh, I think we've, we're going to see if we start to look at the subset skills in these areas that uh, in certain grade levels across the SU, we've got areas and gaps in our curriculum. Um, and so those are things we're going to be continuing to report out to you of what we're finding, but um, then we need to address the curriculum accordingly. I would say that our expectations in writing are not well articulated, and this is a writing assessment as much as anything. Um, Pretty much across the board. Math and, yeah. Yeah, math and every assessment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, the, and we haven't spent much time on it as an SU. Um, as far as PD and or really articulating, what do we expect the student at the end of second grade to do? What do we expect the student at the end of fifth grade to be able to do? And so, there's also some calibration I think we need to do with writing around expectations. What does a proficient writing piece look like? at the end of third, you know, in third grade and fifth grade. So those are all the really exciting things. I think the key for us is we got to just continue to take it one step at a time. And so the money that you invest in Fountain Sampanel was important in the PD, because you need your kids to be able to read on grade level at the end of grade three, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is this assessment doesn't measure that. This assessment's about a whole lot more than reading on grade level at the end of grade three. So now it's time to take it to the next level around our expectations and PD and instruction. So, you know, we've really got kids reading on grade level, now we can have them be reading to learn and reading close reads and responding on demand uh, close reads, which is what this assessment does. Besides the, the testing, is there any other, like, assessment that gets done, like, you know, whether it's, you know, an assignment or some piece of work that the students do throughout the year, or like, you know, again, things that, you know, I, I know they get the report cards and stuff, but like, you know, later on down the line, like a month after it, do you all ever go back and like look at one set of work that the students did and again, look at, do an assessment of it of, you know, this is something that should be meet, meet you know, that should be a good measure of if they're meeting their goals or not. And yeah, our group is, is, just like the SBAC says, they're missing it, or wait, this shows a little bit different than the SBAC that they are achieving better. It's just that maybe they're not on the exam. A, an area for us to grow in. Um, I think we have done a lot of relying on the SBAC and STAR. And up till now, we have like two, two, maybe three, maybe four different math programs. To, and we haven't been able to have common conversations or do like end of unit tests and say like, wow, how did all of our fourth graders do? But I think that now we can because we're launching in kind of the same program and we're able to talk about the same thing. If we all thought this, have to go. So I look forward to that. I don't think we've had that in math. We've had more of that in literacy in the past school year. Yeah. But not in, no, I mean, and so I do think we can develop performance tests, right, that are mm -hmm. SU wide that we're going to give and then bring our third grade teachers together and say, let's look at this performance task in mathematics. We could say, all right, we're gonna have our students do this in fourth grade and around writing and bring our teachers together. I think the more we can bring our teachers together to calibrate that, the better, right? Because expectations look different classroom mm -hmm. to classroom. Right. What you think is proficient, what I think proficient would be different, even if we have a rubric. Yeah. So that calibration piece is important. It's also why those early release days across the SU were so critical. So now that we can do that. I think we also get back to instructional rounds with the pandemic close or different, right? So teachers can go in and watch other teachers. Yes. And they can learn about themselves by seeing that, but also learn about that person. And then those two have that higher level professional conversation. And they're what we usually ended to organize this a couple of years ago, maybe three teachers go in and watch one teacher. Then that group of three teachers talked about what they just saw. To give feedback to that teacher. All none of it's evaluative. Yeah. It's all about raising the performance and feedback. Pretty powerful. We are doing yeah. it again this year, specific to math. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. 
excited. That good for now? A lot to there and a lot to unpack, as they say. And we're on it. I would say this too. I think we're trying to shift the culture to say that the SBAC data is worthwhile and we need to utilize it to improve instruction. I think there was a culture here, when, certainly when I taught here, that, all right, no big deal, it's just one test. Well, actually, that test is built upon the Common Core State Standards. We can't just say it's one test. I mean, we, we should be analyzing that test to see, again, where are our curricular gaps? Like, where are we not rigorous in it? Mm -hmm. um, so building that culture now to say, the test, that test isn't bad. There was a culture in schools that that test was bad. Test is not bad. It actually does somewhat assess some habits of work, right, around grit and stamina. And to say, well, we're not teaching it a test, but we're still going to use that as a data point to assess where are our gaps in curriculum. Yeah. Um, and so I think, really, in general, my sense is <clears throat> we didn't do that a lot. We didn't dig into that all as an SU. And that's, so that's something we're going to start to do. I think this class we're all taking, all the principals, I think there's about nine or ten of us in mud because it's principals and teachers. That's and the idea is, is that there's be another cohort you know, that we keep getting everybody thinking about and understanding that because we all think we know it, but we also can learn more. We need to continuously improve. Yes, because during the retreat piece when we were in our breakout group, I talked to Andrew about it a little bit, but you know, for engineering, we have to be accredited for our students to be able to become licensed professional engineers down the line if they want to and stuff. But we have to do assessment. And, you know, I gripe about it and stuff, but it's more about the self-assessment report that you have to write every six years. That's the one that's the pain in the butt. But but the assessment of the assignment or something that that's something that's that's useful. But you know, in the moment, you know, you're just worried about grading stuff and getting it back to your students. So it's nice to keep a copy of it and then, like I said, like a month later or something like that, when we have a little bit of time, sit down and look at it reflectively and say, okay, how did they do on that, you know, on that goal or whatever that we were working for? And, you know, did they hit it? Was it something that I did wrong or or is it just something with the group or is Why it, each, yeah. this item everybody yeah. missed? What's yeah. going on? And then, yeah. and then what can we do to fix it for, for those students later on? So, you know, it's... Definitely helpful, but you know, sometimes it can be, it seems like a lot for you. It's also hard not to personalize it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, Jamie and I worked with some middle school teachers because the scores were so low and they were holding it themselves. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that, but there's also, that's not helping us at the moment. Right. But let's honor that you're holding that and that you're that invested and let's make that investment important. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of it too is like, you know, if they can, you know, maybe what they're doing in the classroom, maybe a different assessment that they can use helps show them too that it's not necessarily them. But right. Yeah. You know, a single exam, it's it's tough. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Even when you get to college and graduate school and stuff, you know, it's those. It you know, it, it's everybody knows that you know it's not truly reflective, but unfortunately, that's the way things happen. Threshold. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when we selected the math program that you know, we were trying at ready and well, did we use some of this data to see like which one performed better? Yeah, we actually, so we had teachers that um, have been using the program, tried it, and we talked about a couple different points that I surveyed all the staff and talked about like, what we value in a program and rigor and a bunch of different pieces. And the staff actually came to picking this program based on those the points that they reported out on and said this program seems much more rigorous let's go with this for now no program's perfect we do know that um, i think that the exciting thing for us is that we're all coming from similar place we can talk about how it's going when we're teaching it and where the where the gaps are and attack it as a team and not be saying well but we're doing this and we're doing this and we're not talking the same language yeah. and then when a kid transfers between two schools it's a whole different system of learning so i think it's good for now <laughs> but there wasn't any way to like look at the student data well and it's kind of hard this year sort of a hard year to do that and yeah 
All right. <laughs> I would say that, you know, one of the things that I think we were focused on is not just the program, though. Mm -hmm. It's really about the PD. Mm -hmm. And so really trying to strengthen our elementary teachers' understanding of mathematics yeah. and content knowledge of it to understand if a student's struggling where that milestone maybe have been missed. A lot of elementary teachers don't get into elementary education. No offense here, Tracy, by the way, you may have, but to teach math, right? Like a lot of them really love teaching literacy um, and feel much more comfortable about literacy. And so one of the things we're looking to do is try to give our teachers um, really more confidence in math. And so part of that's the focus PD is not in a program, by the way. It's in deepening their content. Well, I'll understand it. follow up to that and say what well, Owen saw, you know, he's talking about teachers like talking about math, was actually an Onda suggestion. She said that why don't you start all your meetings doing a math problem and talking about it? Because, you know, there's even people who say, like, oh, I'm not good at math. And so we need to take the people that work in our schools so that everyone feels comfortable and confident in math. So that's really what you saw was them tackling a math problem and talking about how you would do it with the class. Right. And um, so we're trying to just, Normalize and it. it's so cultural. I was reading something from Dr. Biden the other day, and she said her least favorite subject was math. I think it just reinforces that concept, right? Mm -hmm. Who would say that they're no good at reading, even if you are? Mm -hmm. we, we don't say that culturally, but it's okay to say culturally, I'm not good at math. I I now say, like, math, all this math is about reading, so you're not good at reading. I don't want to shame anybody, but it's really a mindset of, of if it's if you're not strong in it, say it, and that's okay. We're going to build it. Right. We'll help you build that muscle. And a program like the program they chose is not the curriculum. We know that. Right. No, it's a tool. To yeah. To teach things. your proficiency. Yep. Yeah. A lot of work to do. Right. Any other questions on the best back data report? Okay, why don't we move on to COVID-19 updates in regards to mitigation techniques. Uh, so the executive board met uh, last Monday, and Chris was there as your, as your proxy um, and voted, which was great. And um, what I did is I approached the executive board and said, the updates around mitigation are masking inside. Um, at that point, I was hoping to have some additional uh, information from the Department of Health or AOE that has not been forthcoming. Um, and so we're still awaiting uh, some additional quarantine guidance from them. Uh, we're still um, awaiting whether or not they may give us some guidance around cafeteria use. That's a question that superintendents have asked for. Uh, we keep getting told that it will be forthcoming. Um, and so... Yeah. <laughs> Um, eat outside until Halloween. So, I mean, I, I will share this. I shared it with the executive board. I was, uh, it was in, in front of all the superintendents. I was really pointed, the Secretary French, um, about the fact that I really thought the approach early on, I think they're strengthening their approach, yeah. was um, to say, here are some, here's guidance. We can't, we're not in a state of emergency there, so we cannot um, say that these are mandates and or requirements and oh by the way it can be a local decision i think that they really put school boards in tough situations um, and so i said to the executive board last year the executive board empowered me to make decisions in regards to operations around safety it's it is in title 16 as part of the superintendent's role is to ensure that operations are are providing a safe learning environment for students and so the executive board um, continued to empower me around making decisions around operations. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, it showed strength in that across the SU last year. I don't think everyone has to agree. I think that they should ask questions. And we, I'm certainly always welcome uh, questions and to discuss the reasoning of why. I don't make these decisions alone. Uh, I make these decisions um, after being in weekly update meetings with Secretary French. I'm a part of the Winooski Valley Group, who's meeting weekly again to discuss our approach regionally. Um, and I meet with the SU nurses and Shane Oaks. And so I met with the SU nurses and Shane Oaks last week. Um, right now, we're using the guidance around 
uh, requiring face mask um, to start the school year. We'll relook at it. I will tell you that the 80% threshold uh, proves some difficulty in your two buildings. Um, and what I mean by that is that you have an ecosystem with elementary and yeah. middle school students in it and elementary and high school students in it. Um, and so the guidance is, is that once uh, the population that's eligible to be vaccinated reaches 80%, that, that that population no longer is required to mask. I have a, a lot of concerns about our older students not being masked in front of elementary students. Mm -hmm. um, and so at this point, we're going to stick with everyone's masked and we'll continue to revisit that and that group, that committee. And we share um, buses. And we're, we share well, buses federally, uh, federally right now, you're still required on public transportation to be masked. Um, and so students would need to be masked on buses. Uh, there's no, there's no right now guidance for uh, all sports outside, just so you know, um, in regards to masking. So. And what um, about recess? Because I did read your no, no. Outside, there's outside no masking there's requirements. Even the, within our district, that's been correct. your decision. Okay. Yeah. As of right now, um, inside indoor masking at this point. That doesn't mean it won't change. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that I'm going to have more guidance that's going to come out over the next week or two. Um, you know, Ray and I joke, we had to like, on a fly, a day before Thanksgiving, say to folks, we're not supposed to travel, right? Because right. of an announcement, <laughs> which was really difficult. So um, I'm hopeful. I got a superintendent's meeting on Thursday uh, with Secretary French. He tends to release guidance just before the meeting or right after. Uh, I'm hoping there's some additional updates on Thursday. Um, but at least I know that the masking was a hot button topic for folks. I meant when I said in the letter, um, you know, it's it it's something that I wasn't looking forward to. I was hoping the data was going to be better, and I was frankly thinking that masking was going to be an optional thing, mm -hmm. and that if folks weren't comfortable, that they could mask, um, and we'd let that be a choice. Um, but the Delta variant and data is showing that that's not um, something that we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I do take the safety of our students and staff unbelievably seriously. And um, you know, the idea that one kid could get sick due to the decision that at the end of the day I have to make, that is something that I don't, you know, that, that weighs on me all the time. And so, um, you know, I think if folks wonder what lens am I coming from, it's that. Um, and as far as uh, yeah, speaking that, to our attorney. Half a percent or 2% that end up in the hospital, those are kids. Mm -hmm. Those are still, and that's multiple kids throughout our SU if, if kids, if there was a major outbreak. The, and I did navigate a major, a pretty significant outbreak in Stockbridge, and we mitigated it, and we got kids back. What we did last year worked, but I will tell you that dealing with a pretty significant outbreak at Stockbridge was not fun, mm -hmm. um, and it, it was it was wearing. And so, you know, we got to take this stuff seriously. We are. We know how to do this. We've done it really well. We know the mitigation techniques that we used. I'm positive that there was asymptomatic students in our schools and we didn't have widespread issues. Um, we had one issue and you know, a lot, if you look at it, it's my smallest school and the most condensed populations, right? In that one building. So- And health screenings? Health screenings are not required, but what I will tell you is, is that I've met with the nurses and that if student is exhibiting symptoms, they're gonna once again be asked to isolate and go home. And I will clarify that with families. Um, so that's not just following your nurses. The, we are gonna ask parents if kids are sick to please keep them home. Um, we're gonna ask parents to use due diligence around these things. I think it's important for folks to know another big change is, is that uh, our approach here was that if we had a positive case, we paused for three days. We did our, our quarantining and we came back. I'm not saying that that's not the way we may approach it, but what you need to know is right now that due to the fact that we're not in a state of emergency, the secretary doesn't have the ability to waive those days. And so I need 50% of the students in attendance in order to count it as a student day. So we cannot pause and just go remote. Um, and so that may change our approach possibly. 
it's something that I'm continuing to work with the nursing staff with um, around how we may approach that. And I'm, again, looking at how are folks going to approach that regionally. I would say we had a very conservative approach to that compared to other districts um, in regards to some folks just would shut down and quarantine a class, uh, which would be permissible. So we could quarantine a class, go remote with them, and still count it as a student day. So that is probably going to be some type of model like that that we employ. Hopefully, I hope they come out with some revised guidance on that because in the I listened to the press conference today and a reporter asked about, you know, what if a school needs to go remote or they decide that going remote is the best thing to do. And the Secretary of Education said, oh, well, we'll be very supportive of the schools and, you know, allow them to, you know, make sure that the students are, are educated the way that they best see fit and stuff. So, you know, knowing what you had said at the at the SU, at the executive board meeting, you know, and then what he said in the press conference, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully they revise their, their guidance to, to allow for some of those things, but what we did last year. So that then, would be great. Yeah. Right. Exactly. He's certainly hearing that from superintendents um, and I'm sure constituents, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if a state of emergency could get put back into place prior to the opening of the school. I think it's going to be based on data. I do think they make their decisions on it. A lot of those things are going to require that because he doesn't have the ability uh, per law to provide that waiver at this time. He's made that clear. So by him saying that, maybe there could be a forthcoming state of emergency. I don't know, by uh, Chris, but. Um, you know, certainly I I liked our approach. Yeah. It's an approach that I thought worked really well, and it's something that um, certainly if we're provided the opportunity, we would continue to utilize. I think it stopped spread, you know? Mm -hmm. I think we were able to navigate some positivity in our schools and not allow it to be widespread because we did hit the pause button. Okay. Any other questions around it? I mean, there will be more guidance forthcoming. The board will always get the letter up before it goes out to the public. So if you get have a question or comment about it, email us. Um, and uh, there won't be any surprises. And we'll continue to talk through it the entire time um, around our approach. I don't know of any districts at this point who have not decided to mask. Um, but there, I don't know if there will be or not. Anything else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. There certainly won't be any districts within this SU, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about across the state. Yeah, I haven't. Heard of I've heard of protests, but mm -hmm. I haven't. Heard. Schools have made that decision. Not so much COVID related, but like last year, using the blizzard bags potentially for snow days and things like that. Would it sounds like that's not an option? No, no, that was guidance that was allowed under the state of. Mm -hmm. So it's right. snow day is a snow day. Snow day is a snow day. Keep your pajamas on. <laughs> <laughs> Make the hot cocoa. See you on June 19th. <laughs> <laughs> or July 4th. <laughs> All right, moving on to, I guess we don't have any action items today. Um, resignations, new hires. What's that? Do you want to do that discussion about uh, Lisa's letter? Yeah. Under that, is that an action item? Is sure. there any action we need to take? Or well, we do need to do some sort of action. action. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't we do that now? It's good time. Can we just use the process we used to fill Bob Gray's seat, where we put a an ad out and we get letters and people come to the board and then. I think that works. Choice. Let's try and let's try and get that done for next month, though. Like yep. get letters in. I'll get it. I I'll get in the Herald for next week. Perfect. And we'll have the due date prior to there. I usually do it like the Friday before, and then you, mm -hmm. we can send them to you, and then you can have them come. Can and we have it put out on the school Facebook pages yep. as well. Yep. We can. I'll have Christy send you guys the ad. Mm -hmm. So do you want to put it on like the Bethel Community Forum or? Yeah, we can share it from the school page. Lisa was our front porch forum person. 
-hmm. I don't use that, so I don't, I mean, I could learn, but. <laughs> Should I no, I mean, his front porch forum is great, I know. Okay. And it's funny, each one of our towns have a different platform. Some have a listserv, yeah. some have a forum. Yeah, Lisa used to put things on front porch forum, but mm -hmm. I never go there. Do I don't either. I don't. Okay. I mean, if you sign up, you get in your email every day. You don't have to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah I eventually yeah. unsubscribed. It's <laughs> <laughs> enough lost cats for me. I can I can talk to uh, Kate McClinton. Okay. She's going to be our uh, Perfect. Thank you. Ray Jasper. Okay. Well, I guess we don't need any further action on that then. Anything Other than we know. just regretfully, yeah, uh, yeah. except with regret, yeah. for sure. All right, we have a staff resignation that we could add to that list that happened today. A little bit of surprise for resignation of hires. Yep. You want that now? Or, yeah, I uh, just they're on the edge of their yeah, seats. Yeah. 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 Sure. We were too. You remember that? Sure. Jamie texted. I've got news. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Watson, uh, who was hired to be a high school flexible pathways coordinator, uh, has retired from public school public education uh, and is going to become the principal at Bast. Wow, so, uh, a good move for him. Uh, colleague of yours, yeah. Uh, so we have posted that position. You know, that's a bizarre well, thing. Um, and I've, I've reached out to a couple of our part time staff to see what interest they might have in adding to their hours and maybe cover the position that way. And I think we might have a, a good solution in house uh, if something doesn't turn up in the next week. What sort of certification are you looking for? Uh, the ideal qualifications we posted for were somebody with a school counseling background. Okay. Um, but uh, somebody teacher. who has a teacher certificate mm -hmm. uh, and could be somebody who's doing personalized pathways and sign off on as a teacher of record for somebody doing science or social studies or English or dual certified is beautiful, but I understand where we're at right now in the hiring game, right? Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. what certainly drew Charlie was a known commodity, but he was also duly certified, which was huh. um, a bonus. We we have had um the amazing luck in the last couple of weeks of finding incredibly qualified people um uh, we've hired yeah really well a music educator with 18 years of experience if you had a chance to see that who's moving from west virginia this saturday to be part of our community we couldn't have gotten luckier um my point four five uh point four english teacher uh with a master's degree in counseling and an English license. I mean, it was really excited about the, the high quality of some of the staff. Um, the new flexible pathways coordinator over the middle school is supremely qualified and great. That was a reassignment. That was a reassignment. Yeah. yeah. But the what I would say is is that I've interviewed all these folks. Mm -hmm. Um and what I've been really impressed with is that um there's one student centered, right? That's what we want. Mm -hmm. Two, collaborative. And three, I've been really clear about this is a school system on the move. Like, if you want to have autonomous, be a, you know, an autonomous practitioner and not work as a team and or focus on continuous improvement, improvement this is not the place for you. Uh, we want folks that are coming in that want to learn, be continuous learners and who really want to be great um and so i would say that these candidates that the committees and the principals have forwarded to me um have met that bar i've been really impressed um, so it's a really solid candidate pool that you guys got the only other update we have on our new hires is that um what are you doing so I, was, I was trying to get the camera to go oh. <laughs> the only other update I have on new hires is that we're still short a few special educators in the SU. That is a statewide issue right now. I'm looking at Lisa to see if her head's shaking. Um, and so uh, I'm confident that we have a plan B 
if we don't get every single hire in place, we will be able to start the year and meet our kids' needs. Um, I'm hoping that we're not having to do that. I'm hopeful that we're able to lock in another person um, so that we're appropriately staffed. I think the state is being a little more flexible yeah. with emergency licenses and provisionals. Um, and special ed, yep. Yeah. Which normally there's no, no. flexibility right. there. Mm -hmm. um, I can't read what you But said. yeah, definitely a shortage. Um, could you give me a reminder on what the flexible pathways in the middle school were? Like what that position is going to be doing? Just take it together. Sure. Uh, so we, Nicole Lamar was transferred to the high school, where her strengths are going to sit very nicely with Hannah McShinsky leaving, mm -hmm. and so we did not fill that school counselor position, and we created a flexible pathways coordinator, and their position will work in concert with the high school one. And the idea is to engage students in. Uh, ways that we may not be engaging in traditional set, but also to build community connections and to work on the personal learning plan programming. Um, okay, so is the idea that like individual students would meet with this person if they wanted kind of unique experiences or something like that? That could be one way, but and also we want that this position, this person, Mr. Snow, to help coordinate our personal learning plans for the entire 148 right. with the advisor program. Okay. Yeah, if a student, I mean, I think there's lots of ways to pathways. I think one of it is creating and their own personalized, you know, path toward demonstrating proficiency, right? So like if the traditional science class is not working for you for it could be a number of reasons. One, you just want to push yourself further, possibly, right? My expectation is, is that Owen's connecting them with Mr. Snow so that they're designing their own independent project. Doesn't mean they're just on their own. He's facilitating that learning. So there's a facilitator, could be a, a mentor uh, in the community, could be that it's even work-based learning. I don't think there's anything wrong with us getting our middle yeah. schools involved in that. And the teacher of record would still be the science teacher, but the science teacher is not in charge of facilitating. The science teacher is in charge of assessing. Right. So we had also with COVID and prior to COVID, we have students that have a hard time getting to school. So the recovery mindset, we want to work with those kids and their families also to, we're not going to retain kids because we know that's a dropout recipe. So we want to help them get up to proficiency in the academic area in a way that works for them and meets our requirements. Is that helpful? Yep. Um, I guess what I'm curious about is like how this is communicated to the parents and students as, as an option. Like is it the sort of thing where the teacher identifies, you know, this kid needs some extra help, so we're gonna send them to there, or this kid could use some extra enrichment, so let's send them, or is it the sort of thing where like you advertise it as an option and then people decide you know, that sounds like fun i want to try something different it's probably going to be a both of those and more uh i would expect mr snow to be reaching out to the entire middle school community at some point okay. parents kids and the teachers are already aware and that people will be sending or kids will be like oh i want to look at this he's also has a vision of creating something called an innovation center, which would be about maybe steam STEM makerspace, but more than that, it could be a place where a group of kids could, he has this idea that they run a podcast about our school mm -hmm. so that they're talking about education from a middle school mindset. And they're maybe interviewing other kids in other schools through, with, with the help of parent and and whatever else they will design that a big piece of that this is they own that part of the education that they're getting cool. another one is an example is we have a kid who's uh, an archer and he's very good at it he's and he's a deer hunter so there's a lot of ways that he could learn about archery but also about physics or the art of the, the bow or the history of the bow 
so we can start drilling into places. We don't want to make them a hate archery eventually, right. but to a point where it works best for him. Cool. And well, so we do still have, a, what we've done is we've got a K-8 school counselor. So instead of having two school counselors, K-8, mm -hmm. we are certainly within the opportunity around the number of students we have that we meet um, school quality standards to have a K-8. Uh, so based on the timing of Hannah's resignation, moving to Cole, knowing that we wanted to bring this on board, just uh, utilizing currently budgeted funds to be able to do that um, and just looking at the model a little different. Great question. Well, well this would be another thing that I'd be interested in the uh, update. Absolutely. It'd be an exciting year. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he and his, whoever, whichever kids he's working with, will want to come to the board. Cool. All right. Um, so is that everything for resignations, new hires? Okay. Um, I guess we have a final public comment. Is there, were there any questions in the chat? Right to credit. Okay. Is there any public comment at this time? Uh, Michelle, go ahead, Michelle. Hey there. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for that um, email today and the COVID policies. I was really excited to see that. Um, I actually wanted to comment on the One Planet. Um, I can raise my hand. I'm one of those parents that uses One Planet as childcare. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to sell myself out even more in this meeting tonight. Um, but we don't have any other options. There's no YMCA, there's no Boys and Girls Club. I'm a New Yorker and those are all options where I'm from. So I think it's common in Vermont for the schools to kind of pick up that role, whether they want to or not. Um, but I, one suggestion that I have that I've noticed is that we have the most half days um, out of all the other districts around us. And for me as a working parent, it doesn't matter if it's a half day or a full day in service. Um, that's a day that I have to take off of work because a half day is not a full day of work for me. So I just want to put it out there that I know that it's a contractual thing, but it would be awesome if maybe we could have less half days. I could get into the science behind how they're not great academically. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's probably some teachers out there that uh, could comment on the fact that learning is really hard on a half day. Um, we might actually be doing a disservice to our kids by putting them in school for a half day instead of just having a full day of no school. So we should full day in Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Michelle, I may reach out to you in regards to if you had any availability to um, speak as eloquent as you do around the science of, of uh, COVID and masking. And if you'd be right. open to assisting me uh, in some possible other district board meetings. So there's no pressure, just if you'd consider. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna come to these meetings. I'm gonna come to the meeting tomorrow night. Um, you know, one thing I should also say is I, I agree with what was said earlier. I feel like the process that you went through for the anti-discrimination policy was amazing. Um, I can't say any more than I'm incredibly impressed. Um, I think y'all did a great job and uh, I'm gonna show up in support of it tomorrow night too, but I'm happy to keep popping into these meetings and if I'm needed, I'll, I'll talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any other public comment at this time? I'll just agree with Michelle that last year, was it last year? I think last year we took away a number of the half days and put them on the beginning of the year because we had to, because we had to prep for COVID and it was this great, as a parent, I loved seeing that. I was like, oh, well, that's great. I don't have to worry about all those crazy half days. But, those were full days, I think. Right, we, you made them full days on the beginning of the calendar. So it was full day professional development and took away the half days of professional development and as a parent that was awesome i'm not <laughs> sure we can do that but um yeah the the calendar conversation started because we had one district two districts that had half days every friday in the su and other districts who didn't um and so the union approached me about trying to rectify that 
Um, and so we put together a committee that had administrators and members uh, of your teaching staff that came up with this um, concept. Um, and so I think stay tuned. I don't think it's forever, um, but this is where that was how we got there. Just so you know, there's a there's a backstory as to why we needed to address that, and part of that had to do with we are a SUY collective bargaining agreement, um, and there were some equity issues around two districts having uh, PD every Friday, mm -hmm. while other districts didn't. So that that's the why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything else on the bottom of the agenda? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, they did. I noticed that it didn't print front to back. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think unless there's anything else, maybe we can adjourn. The next meeting is Tuesday, September 21st, 6 o'clock. Yep. It feels so long away. Yeah. <laughs> What's the date, Rick? Uh, Tuesday, 21st, September 21st, 6 o'clock. Thursday, fall. Is it really? Yeah. Goodness. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the food. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.